Okay, I'm going to be recording this on my phone as, as normal. Now, as I said in the email, after Derek's class and we got a bit sidetracked onto Fiducia Complans, I am going to talk about it tonight and there's a reason. Well, there's a couple of reasons why I wish to do so. One, specifically because it is not unrelated to our work on the divine will. So I will hopefully show why it's important to tackle this and to introduce into this some wisdom and some insight, not coming primarily from me, but for others who are more learned. And secondly, because if we tackle it now, we don't have to go through other things that come up. This, there's going to be other things that are simply going to come up again and again. So I thought it is worth spending a little bit of time on this and then tie it into the theme of prayer from the gospel today. So two primary observations I'd like to make. One is always, always notice that confusion is from the devil. Confusion, a lack of unity, always comes from the devil. He seeks to bring down Holy Mother Church. Of course, he can't do that, but he seeks to rent it, to divide it, to create schism. And, as we know through the popes, saints and mystics, he wishes eventually to set up false worship. So none of us need be in doubt. It is clear from church authority, from the saints, from scripture itself, that we are living at a stage where the battle, the power of the devil, is never been so strong. Because he also knows that he is desperate. His time has almost run out and so he's like a child that is having a tantrum that can't get what it wants it lashes out indiscriminately and causes as much damage and upset as it can second observation note immediately how things progressed a document is released by the Congregation for the Faith, with the approval of the Pope, and within minutes, within a very short space of time, the whole media is in uproar. Blogs are saying this, blogs are saying that, people are commenting. As soon as we see something like that, we need to stand back and say, this situation is not from God. I need to stand back, I need to take a deep breath, I need to recover my bearings, because the last thing we should wish to do is to enter into confusion and to become cut adrift from the church. Those things seem to me so clear and so obvious. The third prime preliminary observation is, generally speaking, which means 99% of the time, if the modern media are telling you one thing, you can immediately assume that the opposite is true. You notice that they immediately throughout this pontificate have seized upon comments of the Pope, documents of the Pope and have used them for their own ends and their own agenda. This relates to us and our course in the divine will is because we want nothing, nothing whatsoever to distract ourselves from doing our acts, our rounds, the hours of the passion in our daily life. 
And this temptation is going to grow. What do I mean this temptation? The temptation to be over anxious as to what is going on, who is saying what, what is the latest prophecy, is it going to be next year, is it going to be tomorrow, what does so and so say, and all it does, and Father Unitsi keeps reminding us, is simply distract us from our primary task. All of you here know enough. All we need to know is we are in the end times, as again Father Nutsi points out. We need to know we're at a crucial stage of church history. We need to know that there is an imminent triumph and it has already been set in progress that will lead to the era of peace. And therefore the battle is going to be fierce and we need to simply welcome it because the birth pangs bring about the joy when the child is born. So let nothing disturb our peace. And I could see from the chat comments on Tuesday, when I just briefly said something and Derek mentioned it, that there is still confusion out there. So let me clarify a couple of positions that are very clear. And I was lucky, well fortunate, providential, that I had staying with me at the time this document was released, a professor of systematic theology at a university in Nigeria who has written books, he's learned, and we were able to sit down, look at the text, come to a conclusion. So let me say some things with not my authority, but the authority of theologians. One is there is nothing in this document that is contrary to the perennial teaching of the church. That's number one. I'll take questions at a certain time if you've got them. So one is, there is nothing in this document, if you read it carefully, that is against the teachings of the church. Secondly, it is very clear what it is doing and what it is not doing. And if we reference the previous document from the Congregation of the Faith in 2021, the document is clear that one is not under any circumstance allowed to bless, acknowledge, give a liturgical blessing upon a same-sex union. That is absolutely clear. Now just hang on a sec, I'm going to explain the reaction to it in a minute because many of you will be thinking about why this reaction. The next point, what we always have to do in a document is to see not only the text of the document but the context. And this is where it is very important for our journey in the divine will. What is the context? The context of this document it was a question, well, first of all, I'll give you the smaller context than the larger one. The smaller context is this document was a response to some requests from the congregation to the congregation of the doctrine of the faith about whether it was licit to bless same-sex unions. So the congregation issued its response. Whether or not it was prudent to do it at the particular time is luckily not the thing that comes to me. But more importantly, you need to consider the wider context and the shift in theology. Well, let me explain that better. The, this, the shift in the application of perennial principles two practical situations. So Father Unitsi writes quite clearly about theology that doctrine can never change, but how one applies this 
will change from time to time. And on Tuesday, but in case people weren't there, I gave the example. The example in the early church in the 4th and 5th centuries, when Christians who had surrendered their books or who had committed apostasy, there was a debate as to whether they could be forgiven and allowed back into the church. Now think about that. Put yourself at that time. Okay, think about that. To us now it seems obvious. Well, of course, any sin can be forgiven. But in the context and given the situations of what was happening, the church made certain judgments, which of course eventually Augustine and his followers won. So it is an example whereby you have a situation where the application of the teaching changes depending on circumstance. Now, the wider context, which is where I begin to tie it into the divine will, is Pope Francis, quite rightly, has used the phrase of the world at the moment as a field hospital. And it was, I think, his greatest contribution, at least to me, to gain understanding that what I find in practice is very clear. People are damaged, they are wounded, they have suffered terrible abuse, they have been poorly catechized, they have had no love in their lives, they are seeking in their lives something to hold on to. Therefore, one cannot apply principles in the same way today as one would have done 50 years ago. It's simply impossible, and that's how priests already are working. And remember, in the divine will, if we seek to the divine, if we seek to live in the divine will, and this is something Tony Hickey pointed out on the retreat I was at, we desire the salvation of everyone. So remember, that's at the heart of it. We cannot go any distance in to live in the divine will unless we truly desire the salvation of all, without exception. Again, Jesus points out to Louisa that the fact that some souls do not make use of this grace does not stop us for praying for the good and the salvation of all. So we have to have that foremost when everything comes up. We are here to save, to implore, to impetrate for all souls of all times, of all dispositions. <clears throat> and the greater the situation, the sinful situation they find themselves in, the greater the right they have to mercy and the greater right they have to our intercession in the divine will. So we must remember that at all times. We cannot go forward in the divine will unless we understand that we're here for everyone. We're there, we're there to pursue the greatest good. <clears throat> Next point is this wider context of theology. Now, we have to remember a simple distinction. Sacraments, and this is important background for all of us to remember, sacraments and liturgy are God sending his grace and his blessing downwards on to us which is why a liturgical blessing for a union can only be given to a marriage union or a couple that are engaged or a couple that are living in the following 
the commands of the church. So there are certain liturgical blessings that are given for those different situations. And that is their purpose. And the document is quite clear. They are for those alone. They are not to be used in any other circumstance regardless. But this is something Father Elias contributed to my understanding of this. Sacramentals and non-liturgical blessings we define as us seeking God. Now that's a very important distinction. Liturgical blessings are God's blessing coming upon us. They go through what Jesus passed to the church and they come down to us in the manner prescribed by the liturgical law of the church. But everyone is sinners. Everyone is needing to seek the face of Christ. As we see in the gospel today. Come and see. Therefore, blessings can be used to aid people to find God. And the document makes it clear and the document that sought to clarify this gives examples of how such a blessing would be used. But to cut to the very simple part of it, if a couple comes to me, if a couple is living, a non, uh, the same sex couple is living together, but let's put it in quite often the context. People who are broken, people who are not probably in a state of grace, people who are struggling, people who have had terrible experiences, but by the grace of God are prompted to cry out for help, to seek help. Now, if anybody asks for help, it seems to me imprudent to start questioning, to start demanding, to start looking in, to start judging, to start assessing, are these people deserving of help? It seems to me contrary to everything that Jesus did in the Gospels. He sought out the sinners. He called Zacchaeus down. Zacchaeus, today I am coming to spend at your house. He didn't start telling Zacchaeus, look, if you sort your life out, I'll come and stay with you. He called him down. Now, the document is also clear that that blessing must be done in a prudent way. It should not be public. The priest should carefully ascertain to make sure that those receiving the blessing understand it. But. Father Elias, at the same time we were discussing this document, had a call from a priest who he taught at seminary whose apostolate is working with the gay community in Australia. And he was saying this gives him now a powerful tool. People can feel that God has not forgotten them, that God is calling them and telling them, look, I love you. To love someone doesn't mean that we therefore accept where they are, as Pope Benedict makes clear. But God is telling them, look, I am here. I'm crying out to you. I want you to come to me. I want you to change, to convert. But unless that love is shown, unless people understand that they are not judged first, they will, if they feel that they are, they will not respond to an outreach, an outlook. Now I'm drawing to the end here. Father Unutzi, in a recent article, which happened to come to me just this afternoon, so I haven't had time to absorb it, but I was very pleased that it is along similar lines. He points out several examples where similar ha things have happened to other popes. So we forget this. Let us take, he gives two examples, one where I don't like using terms right, but let's say more of the right of the church, absolutely criticised John Paul II for his attendance 
at the ecumenical prayer meetings at Assisi. There was a huge outcry, out, outcry at the time from what we term in inverted commas, the right wing. I know because I was in the SSPX at the time and I too criticized the Pope. So I know exactly what it is to fall into that error. To see things from a very limited point of view. And that's normally what happens is that we react to something because we have one part of the truth and we fall into the temptation to think we have every part of the truth. That is why Jesus keeps emphasizing to Louisa the importance of the Pope. The importance of the Pope. So one example he gave was when those criticized the Pope and said he'd basically committed apostasy, he had done an unforgivable thing, and so on. Father You Not See then gives an example from the opposite point of view. Paul the Sixth and his encyclical Humane Vitae, which caused on the other wing of the church a complete outcry too. And people were saying we're not going to obey this. And Cardinal Stafford, who I heard speak, told us, related, he was Bishop of um, Baltimore, told us that all the priests met in the cinema, the priests of the diocese, to sign a letter to the Baltimore Times, the main, whatever that was, the main paper in that, saying they would not follow this teaching. And he was the only priest who didn't go forward to sign it. So let's remember in all this that this is not the first time this has happened. So very quickly, because I don't want to spend much longer, but I want to try and make some clarity. Let us look at the reactions to this, because I know some people were concerned about, at least in the chat, saying, well, look, why have the Nigerian bishops said this? Why have these people reacted like this and so on? So again, in the document itself, it is pointed out that different bishops' conferences will weigh up their own situation and will apply it in different terms. The African bishops have since released a statement of all Africa about this and Pope Francis himself agreed to it. So Pope Francis agreed with the reaction of the African bishops. Why? Because they were doing exactly what the document said they could do, which is to apply their situation depending on legal laws, customary situation in the country to where they were living. So one reaction is completely understandable. The second thing we have to understand about the reaction is that there is nevertheless within the church a movement that seeks to introduce homosexuality and same-sex marriage. That is clear. That is within the church. That is not the Pope, but that is a movement within the church. And bishops' conferences were reacting not just to the document, but to this movement within the church and to how it was seeking to gain power, particularly in Germany. And that's where I'll end. The last point is that the Pope, none of us can know what the burden must be like to run the universal church. It's impossible for us to imagine. The German church is in danger of schism. We could even say de facto, it is there already. They have gone, they have used this document wrongly. They have continued the wrong things. The Pope is trying to hold out to them, to bring them back, to show them what a true understanding of compassion is, of love, within the context of truth. Truth without love will be cold, and love without truth will be ill-disciplined 
and soon go off the rails. So I really suggest you get hold, and if you want, I can forward it to you, but it's easy if you go to, if you put in Father Yunutsi Fiducia Complans, you will get his excellent article on this. It's very good. It's there very thorough. And it's seeking to make clear to us what is happening, what the role of the magisterium is, what the role of the Pope is, and to a slight extent, he brings it into the divine will. So remember, the bottom line is, we desire the salvation of all souls. We are with the Pope. It does not mean, <clears throat> to be with the Pope does not mean that the Pope will always do things prudently. It doesn't always mean that he will say things off the cuff that are necessarily correct. It doesn't even mean to say that in minor things he will be in error because, like us, sometimes he speaks a personal opinion, sometimes as Pope. To give you an example, I disagreed when Pope Francis told us we should have the vaccine. Now, he was not telling us that in a papal document as a universal pastor of the church. He was giving his opinion, and one has to respect it. He's the Pope. We respect his opinion. But one is free to disagree with that, because it is a level where disagreement is acceptable. So it's very simple, brethren, is that do not let this derail you from the task of living in the divine will, of desiring the salvation of all. These things are going to occur. We know the truth. We have the catechism, we have the scripture, we have the magisterial documents. We will not compromise. So it's a difficult road to tread. We have to tread the middle road. It's so easy to go one way or the other. And I think Thomas More is an important saint to use as an example in this time. He was both wise, truthful and prudent. He knew the truth. He was wise enough to know that he was not the judge of other men's souls. He was prudent enough to know that one does not take a stand until required by the situation. And that will differ from person to person. And you can therefore have two saints who choose a different path on this. When Thomas More was eventually put in the situation whereby he'd done his best, he then told things exactly as they are. So we need to keep truth, prudence, peace within our hearts. Do not let the devil's convulsions derail us. It's not worth it. And normally, if we didn't have the internet, if we didn't have all the modern communications, these events would not be so tumultuous. And I promise this is my very last comment. I had a word given to me in wisdom. I don't get them often, hardly ever, but I got one word. It had come from a psalm. It was a Latin word, because I, I like reading Latin, as you know. Neshivi, which means I do not know. And if one thing is becoming clear to me personally, is how little I know how little I really know and are therefore able to judge. Now, as a priest, as a teacher, there are some areas one are called to have knowledge about, cause to judge on. But there's so many areas where it is so difficult that I cannot see how people can have such, I'm not talking about this group, but the reaction to this document, have such authority and have such 
certainty about matters where even the best tread lightly and carefully. So be encouraged, be encouraged. Let us go on in peace. Let us go in confidence and let us not let the next thing or however it goes shake us. Let us stick to the truth and when we're asked to defend the truth, let us pray almighty God that his divine will operate in us and we stick up for the truth. And that time will come. That time is going to come. But let us pray for unity within the church constantly. Let us pray for unity within the church. And let us lastly remember that this is precisely why we have this gift at this time. That we can bring all the people that are involved in these arguments. We can bring all the bishops' conferences. We can bring Pope Francis. We can bring those who are scandalised. We can bring those who are misusing church teaching. We can bring them all and put them in the divine will. We can wash them with the precious blood of Jesus. And through our own penance, bring about once again unity within the church. I think that's enough said. I hope there was a clarity there. I hope so. But otherwise, please read Father Unitsi's document. As I said, it only just came to me. Otherwise, I'd have made more use of it in this talk. Um, but that's that. I will take any quick questions that they've um, uh, people have. The, on the chat, the post has been uh, put up there. Um, but please, if there's something you'd like to ask, I'd like to get it cleared up now because things are going to happen again and we don't want to constantly interrupt the teaching to go through this. So this is a useful exercise to center us, keep us on the right track. Hi, Nate. Good. Please, if you've got a question, please answer it. Do not feel... Um, Or if you've got a private question, send the um, send the uh, send the question to me on my chat. Okay, I want to turn to now look at the gospel of today, a beautiful gospel from Saint John, chapter one that we had at mass today, verses thirty-five to forty-two, and try and relate it in and tie together some topics that Derek especially has been uh, talking about on the interior castle and prayer and therefore the divine will. This Gospel of St. John I find particularly moving. It When one reads it, it's almost as if there is a certain beautiful light this is filtering through the account. It is so simple, and yet it is so deep. It is on the one hand, an historical narration of the call of the first disciples. On the other hand, it is a universal call to all people of all times. And I taught a group of Lithuanian children. I have 23 Lithuanian children who popped out of the woodwork for Holy Communion. And it's, I hope it's not insulting, but they scarcely know their left from their right hand. But it's amazing how this little account, together with showing them an extract of the healing of the leper from the chosen, really captured them. See, we've got to almost look at this account as if we're newborns. Put ourselves in the situation. Imagine the Messiah has been expected and waited upon 4,000 years since the Proto-Evangelium. 
They have been waiting for the Messiah. So just imagine the excitement when John points out and says to them, Look, there is the Lamb of God. Hearing this, the two disciples followed Jesus. Jesus turned around, saw them following and said, What do you want? So straight away, think about this. Jesus turns around. He's walking in a direction. He turns around and saw them. Now, the English can hardly do justice to what must have happened at that instant. That Jesus's gaze penetrates these men. He looks at them. And think of all the times in the Gospels when we hear about that look or it is assumed by the Gospels. For example, the call of Matthew. Matthew is sitting by his revenue table and Jesus passes by, looks and calls. So again, it is this reaching out, it is this Jesus turning towards us, it is Jesus asking this simple question, what do you want? What do you want? And so in the liturgy at Mass, when this passage is read out, we are there. That question is addressed directly to us. What do you want? They answered, Rabbi, which means teacher, where do you live? Now, a little bit of context, because it can at first seem a rather strange reply. What has this got to do with Jesus' simple question? What do you want? We have to understand not only at the time of Jesus in the Holy Land, but throughout ancient civilizations in Rome and Greece, when one followed a teacher, it's not like today. Today, you go to a class, you attend a lecture, you might attend a seminar, a tutorial. But in those days, it was different. You went to live with your teacher because it wasn't just a question of formal teaching. It was the teaching of the whole way of life. That is something I got a taste for when I was at the monastery in France. You see everything there at the monastery. And it could drive you up the wall because the French and the English were often different about things. And the way the French do things can be exasperating. But what the abbot was always trying to teach is that everything in our life, the way we hold ourselves, the way we sit, the way we cut our fruit, all these things tie together. They're all part of learning about our master. So that what we do in liturgy on the altar, imagine you're a server, should be mirrored within our daily life. So one went to stay with a teacher, one observed everything, what he did, how he carried himself, not simply what he taught. Now, that question, as we remember, where do you live, therefore, has a great significance. If we think of it in the context of chapter 17 of Luke, where Jesus tells his followers, the kingdom of God is within you. He makes it quite clear, do not look here, do not look there. And again, in relevance to the first part of this talk, do not start get distracted. We're not going to find the kingdom of heaven here in all this commotion. We're not going to find it within. We're go it's there. We're going to find it within. Now, if you remember, this is Jesus's, one of Jesus's deepest prayers at the Last Supper. Father, that they may be with you and I. So one of the greatest desires of Jesus is that we abide with him. We live with him. 
Now, this is where I'd encourage you to, if you have time, to go back and look over Derek's teachings on the interior castle that we went through um, last year at some time. I can't remember well. Because if you remember, the kingdom of God is within, and Teresa of Avila use is the example of the throne room. That in the centre of our soul is the throne room where God dwells. And we journey through the various chambers and rooms to find it. And that the way we find it is through prayer. Prayer, Teresa says, is the way and the means by which we enter the various mansions. And so this encounter with Jesus, this wanting to know where he lives, is applied to us. It is a question for us each and every day. Are we seeking to be with him and with the Father? Are we seeking with all our heart, our mind and our soul to be with him, to live with him, to dwell with him? Now, this is where divine will teaching elevates our understanding of scripture. Because we know then that through an upright intention, through desiring to place our acts in the divine will, through love of God and for the salvation of souls, and a desire to follow God's will, we immediately place our acts in the divine will and they become divine acts. Now think about this in the context of dwelling where Jesus dwells. That means to say if we make our morning offering the divine will, what we call the prevenient act, it means constantly throughout the day we are in the most intimate union with Jesus that is possible. Now, of course, on the journey, it can go deeper and deeper. There's no end to the depth, either on this world or in the next. But immediately, we, through that prevenient act, by giving our day, our acts to be done in the divine will, are in the closest union with Jesus. Why are we in the closest union with Jesus? Because there is a unity of will. We are allowing our will to receive its impulse or its direction, its principle of action from God. And remember, this is the unity of the Trinity itself, that the Trinity, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit share one will. There is one will in God. And therefore, prayer too becomes elevated in our encounter because, and I'm thinking out loud here, so I've got to be a little bit careful. It's as if encounter is simply giving way to unity. The encounter happens. We make our prevenient act. We make our desire to live in the divine will. And Jesus then takes over. He then takes charge of everything. Which is why he constantly says to Louisa how pleasing it is to him when a soul does this. Because he finds in that soul the full return for everything that he has done. So I want to read, because it's always good to come back to Louisa. This is from the 2nd of March, 1916. 2nd of March, 1916. I think I can give you the volume. No, I can't. I haven't got the volume here. Jesus says the following. My daughter... When the soul gives herself completely to me, 
I establish my dwelling in her. Wow. So that's exactly John chapter 17. It's the passage from the gospel. And we should expect that because it is the same author in all. When the soul gives herself completely to me, I establish my dwelling in her. Again, we know this with our mind. We know this with our mind, but it should constantly take us back. That Jesus wishes to dwell within us. Many times I like to shut everything and be in the shade. Other times I like to sleep and I place the soul as a sentry. That she may not allow anyone to come to bother me and interrupt my sleep. And if necessary, she has to face the bothers herself and answer for me. Other times I like to open everything and let in the winds, the coldness of creatures, the darts of sins that they send me and many other things. Let me read that again and then comment because it's a very profound sentence. Many times I like to shut everything and be in the shade. Other times I like to sleep and I place the soul as a sentry. That she may not allow anyone to come to bother me and interrupt my sleep. And if necessary she has to face the bothers herself and answer for me. Other times I like to open everything and let in the winds, the coldness of creatures, the darts of sins that they send me and many other things. The soul must be content with everything. She must let me do whatever I want. Even more, she must make my things her own. What Jesus is saying now is such is the value he places upon a soul that gives itself to him, that he fully involves it in his life, his mission, in the whole of salvation history. So that if Jesus wants to rest, and remember, the reason, one of the reasons for the divine will at this moment is that we are shifting from looking to ourselves and what Jesus and God and the church does for us and looking to what we can do for Jesus. It's a shift. It's looking what we look that way towards us. Imagine in the church and we turn as Tony Hickey demonstrates, and we look at the tabernacle. So Jesus wants us to concern ourselves with him. So sometimes he's going to allow us in our life irritations. He's going to allow us things that bother us. He's going to allow us to feel coldness. Even physical coldness corresponds to this. Why? Because we are sheltering him. We are centuries surrounding Jesus when he slept. Suddenly come to my mind, again off the top of my head, so it's a bit of a risk. It's a little bit of a reverse of Jesus in the Garden of Olives. Jesus was awake, the disciples slept. We're going to allow Jesus times when he's going to sleep, and we are going to be awake. And the beauty of this means that there is nothing in our life that cannot immediately become prayer. Because whatever is moving in our soul, we immediately turn into prayer. So, for example, uh, uh, irritation. It's easy to feel irritated about things, things, plans that go wrong or things that you just have to shift around or someone that interrupts you. You immediately start thinking, right, what is happening in the divine will looking at things? What is happening? OK, things are irritating me. Let me accept them. Let me embrace them and let me know that by doing this, 
I'm sheltering Jesus. I'm giving him a peace from being disturbed. Another example. Let's take the example of the flood I had before Mass that some of you before we were talking about this when water was just pouring down the walls of the kitchen, the alighting went, Mass was about to start, it was all chaos. So normally most people start or what I would have done a few years ago is get angry, frustrated, cursing this way or that. And you simply say, oh, God wants this to happen. It's his will. Okay, the waters are coming in. Let us pray. Let us pray for the bark of Peter. Let us pray the waters don't enter that. Or we could pray, let the waters of the Holy Spirit flood in. Let it wash all buildings clean. Let it wash us clean. So the beauty of the divine will, it is so comprehensive. It is so easy because we actually don't have to think of anything because everything that is happening, God is using in our relationship with Christ. So that is where things are difficult in the divine will because Jesus says the soul must be content with everything. Now I don't know about you but I still find that difficult certainly from time to time. To be content with everything and this is what Ignatius and the gift of Saint Ignatius to the church help with what we call Ignatius indifference not to prefer health to sickness not to prefer richness to poverty and that is difficult for us that's why it's a journey to be content with everything to surrender everything is difficult it is a path of virtue and we need to pray for that but the rewards are so great so immense that they simply mind boggle us. That once we with simple, and remember to surrender everything, to accept everything, means we do it at the moment with the strength and the grace we're given. And if you worry, as I do, am I going to be doing this? We add in a little prayer, Lord, if you leave it to my tiny, ability to correspond to this I will get nowhere so I simply make this with your will I wish to accept everything with your will I wish to gain and ask that all your peace come to me I want your peace I want your virtue I claim them as my own because you promised and your promise cannot be gainsaid that if I give myself to you, you share everything with me. So when Jesus asks us to come and see, it is the great adventure. There is nothing greater than the adventure to respond to that in the context of the divine will. Other saints until recently couldn't do that through no fault of their own, but because the gift was not yet given. But we have the grace to come and see everything. That means we have the ability to come and see every mystery of Christ's life from his incarnation to his ascension into heaven without exception as our own. That, I think, is exactly nine o'clock. It is a good place to stop. And if you've got some questions, uh, please feel free to answer. Also, I always encourage people, there's people here that have more experience than me in living the divine will. So if you've got experiences to share, clarifications to pass on, please, you know, feel free to do that.
As Derek says, silence either means I'm totally blown it or people have understood it. So. Thank you, John. Derek, is there anything you'd like to to add, to comment? Uh, can you hear me? All yeah. Uh, yeah, no, nothing to add, Father Dominic. Um, really good to just sit back and enjoy the teaching. Thank you very much. Okay. And very comprehensive as well, very comprehensive. Okay, I'm not going to labour questions. We can end with... The most important thing which is some prayer and i will give you a blessing so again derek and i always thank you it is so um what is the word refreshing supportive to us that you give up your time difficult times of the day for some of you to come and listen so we really appreciate that we appreciate your thoughts and remember if you've got questions or things just email us and um, we'll try and sort them out so let us end with a, a prayer and a final blessing um, for some of you it's the day as well it's just starting or just finishing here in the UK Heavenly Father you told us in your holy word through your son that many longed to see this day and never saw it. Many longed to hear your words and never heard them. So Heavenly Father, our gratitude, which is so weak, cannot really measure up to what we hear now what we have seen what you have revealed to us about your holy faith through your servant louisa through your teachings on the divine will that at this time when the world is in so much turmoil so many people lack peace so many people lack trust in you that you have given this sure and certain way to not only follow you but to participate in your innermost life in your innermost mysteries we know Lord that it is difficult for us to surrender to you our lives that we struggle from time to time that we can move out of the divine will so we ask you and we give to you our will, keep us enclosed in your heart. If we are about to go out of your heart, enclose us. Do not let us move out of it. Grant us the wisdom and the prudence at this time in the world's history. Grant us not to be distracted by the world. Not to be and not to commit the sin of curiosity. Keep us centred upon you. From your mother pour to us your graces. And you prayed, Heavenly Father, that they be one. And with this coming week of prayer for Christian unity, we pray tonight for that. And we know, Lord, that that prayer will come when they are one because they are one with your will. So we all now make an act of simple resignation. We resign ourselves to your will. We surrender everything to you. And with complete trust and confidence, we can now rest easily confident that you know all you can do all and you love us and may the lord grant us a quiet 
and peaceful rest and may his blessing come upon you the father the son and the holy spirit amen amen Oh. Thank you, good, Father. thank you all. Have a good day, thank good you. night. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. That was magnificent. Thank you, Father. 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 Thank you so much. Okay, cheerio. Bye, all. Cheers. Bye. 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 Thank you, Father. Everyone's disappearing quickly off the screen. <laughs> Melissa, I'll send you an email. Okay. I only just got it. I'll send you an email. Okay, very good. Very good. Right. All right. Good night, Father. Right, right. Good teaching, Father Dominic. Okay, thank you. Thank you. God bless.